Father, grant keen and true understanding of what truly matters most. And grasping the truth that is truly true, strike our lives in such a way that it will change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 1. And I want to talk to you today about a rather lengthy title, The Pillars of Reality, subtitled, Remaining Sane in an Insane World. The Pillars of Reality, Remaining Sane in an Insane World. Before I read the passage, I want to make a preliminary statement that I believe Perhaps you don't, but I certainly do. And it's within the scope of what, where I'm coming from this morning. The definition of insanity is when that which doesn't make sense starts making sense. And that which makes sense doesn't make sense to the degree that there is no sense. That's insanity. It is equal to turning reality on its head. I believe we are living in an increasingly insane time. And I furthermore believe that it's imperative that the church remain sane in this insane time and preach the truth, which is sanity. John, bless his heart, does not begin his gospel account with angels appearing to shepherds, or wise men coming to bring their gifts to baby Jesus, he begins with the pillars of reality that form the basis of sanity. And I am so glad he did this. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, which will be our sermonic text for the morning. In the beginning was the Word, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. (coughs) He, so the Word is a He here, He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being That has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Or you may have a translation that reads overcome it. This is the way John begins his gospel account of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some expositional handling of the text before I give you the four pillars followed by three applications. First, it is obvious that John is intentionally linking what he is saying here with the book of Genesis. He begins the Gospel of John in the same way that the book of Genesis begins, in the beginning. John is indicating here that the life of Jesus Christ 
and his saving work has expansive impact that goes all the way back to the very beginning of time itself. It isn't just about a Jewish man named Jesus who lived in the first century. Because Jesus, who he is and what he did and its impact on the world is such that he relates to something that grasps the entire human race for all time. Notice that Jesus is not called, he is not called Jesus, but he calls him the Word, actually, several times in verse 1. Again, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You need to know that Jesus is a name given to him by the angel before he was born, predicting who he was and what he would do. The angel says, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is a Savior. But here John calls him the Word. In the beginning was the Word. So he was pre-incarnate. Not only pre-incarnate, before he was made flesh, but also in existence before time began itself. In the beginning was the Word. But not only that, He is God. Again, verse 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is equality here. Furthermore, the Trinity is indicated, and the relationship of personages within the Trinity. Of course, the Scripture will speak more of this. It's only hinted here. So, Jesus Christ is God. The Son of God, who is God indeed. Again, the emphasis in verse 2 about the beginning. He was in the beginning with God. The fact in verse 2 he's called a he indicates he's a person and not simply a force. Notice also in verse 5, and I'm going to deal more with verses 3 and 4 in just a moment. But in verse 5, I indicated when I read that passage that there is, there is a, a, a discussion, perhaps even a debate, over whether the Greek in verse 5, the verb near the end of the verse, should be translated understand or comprehend or grasp, or whether it should be translated overcome. The verb can actually be translated in either ways. I think, as others think, that John intentionally was ambiguous here because he links the ideas of the world being unable to understand the Word of God nor overcome Him as well. I'll handle that a bit more in just a moment. End of textual expositional comment. And let me give you now the four pillars of reality. I believe John is establishing here in the person of Christ who he is, why he matters, and what he did. And he discusses Christ in such a fashion as to give us the very ground of reality itself. And the ground of reality forms the basis of human sanity. Yes, I do believe that John is teaching us here that if we do not rightly understand Christ and His role in reality, we will, because of sinfulness, go stark insane. I will list the four pillars briefly and then we'll back up and deal with each one. First, he gives us the existence and the nature of ultimate reality. Second, he gives us the nature and meaning 
of human or material reality. Material reality. Third, he gives us the relationship of humanity to ultimate reality. And finally, he gives us the cosmic issue and its relevance to the human dilemma. If you didn't get all of those, we'll back up and deal with them individually. First, the existence and the nature of ultimate reality, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Here we are told there is such a thing that is ultimate, we might call, ultimate reality. And it is greater than material reality. And the, the reality we see and sense with our bodies and minds is not eternal, but it's created by God. Furthermore, we are told here that ultimate reality is defined as the Godhead itself. And that the Godhead is personal in nature. It even suggests a plurality in the Godhead. Now why does this matter? You and I are not ultimately real. We had a beginning. The world, indeed all the material reality, is not ultimately real. It had a beginning. But there is an ultimate reality, and that ultimate reality is God Himself. God is the only eternal one who exists from eternity to eternity. God was here before here was here. That is why He describes Himself as I am that I am. There is none before Him. There will be none after Him. There is none equal to Him. He is the ultimate reality of ultimate reality. And He is all that is ultimate. All temporal reality comes from Him. And this ultimate reality forms the foundation for our understanding of all that we see and all that we are and all that we experience in this world. And without that understanding of ultimate reality, we have no answer for the questions that face us today. The existence and nature of ultimate reality. John is arguing ultimate reality has a touch point, And that touch point is Jesus Christ Himself. You cannot ignore Him. You cannot deny Him. And to do so is to go stark insane. Number two, the nature and material, the nature and meaning of material reality. Verse three. Not only is there ultimate reality, but all that we can see and examine relates to ultimate reality. Again, verse three. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Four statements. Material reality is created reality. It did not come to be on its own. It is ludicrous to believe that material reality created itself. That there was something of itself there before it began. That's ludicrous. And yet it is held to by so many people. It is obvious here that John is teaching us that created reality reflects a creator. Who is God himself. Who is ultimate. Who predates this material reality. Furthermore, John is saying that creation has its meaning in its relationship to God. And without God, all that is means nothing. John is also arguing that creation exists for God and for his praise 
alone. We may infer from this that God is the sovereign over us. He controls us. He is worthy of our adulation and adoration. And we are accountable to God. The nature of material reality. Third, the relationship of humanity to ultimate reality. Now we're getting a little closer to home. Verse 4. In Him, in Christ, in the Son of God in human flesh, in Him was life. And the life was the light of mankind. John is implying, and we may infer that John is saying to us that God the Son, in ultimate reality, came to engage material reality in the incarnation, which, in fact, he will clearly state in verse 14 when we get there. But here he implies that he did so because there was both death and darkness. In him was life. Why? Because there was death. He came to be life. And his life was the light of mankind. Why is that important? Because mankind was dark. The darkness of ignorance. The darkness of wrong. The darkness of sin. The darkness of hatred. The darkness of violence was in this world. And yet God the Son came into this world of time and space as life and light. From this we come to understand that humanity as a part of creation has fallen into sin. And sinfulness is nothing more than darkness. It is moral darkness, spiritual darkness, theological darkness. And the darkness of sin destroys. But God is the light. And God has given the light in Christ to the human race. And the human race has no light until Christ came as the light. And the only means by which we are able to have light is in Jesus Christ himself. Furthermore, we might summate this by saying the human race needs the light of Christ. Therefore, we desperately need Christ. Do you follow my argumentation? Sin has come into the world. And because sin is intrinsically sinful, destroying everything it touches, darkness has thus fallen upon creation. In Genesis 3, we're told that the very dirt of the earth has been severely affected by our sin. Death has come into human experience and will remain here until God removes death as the last enemy. But darkness and sin and death, thanks be to God, are not the last words. God is light and He has sent light to the world when He sent Jesus, our Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is the light, and He has brought light to those who will look to Him as Savior and Lord, making us the children of light. And the light of God includes truth and love and goodness and joy. Thus... Every psychological, every social problem, every moral problem in the world finds its taproot in the nature and impact of sin in humanity. Thus, there is no solution to any great problem in the world unless the problem of sin is understood and adequately addressed in Jesus Christ. We try our best to deal with the darkness until we have the light Darkness will not flee. It is only the light that drives away the darkness. And the light is Jesus Christ. Number four. Number four. The cosmic issue and its relevance to the human dilemma. That brings us to verse five. 
where John says, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it or grasp it or overcome it. Several ideas are indicated here. First, God, as the light, intervenes in the world of darkness through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. By the way, that is why at Christmas time we put up lights. Because God as light came into this dark world and we're celebrating the light has come. But, our text would say to us, this world being a world of darkness does not understand the light. It doesn't get it. The campaign, He Gets Us, is so ridiculous. But I will tell you this, we don't get Him either. We don't understand Him. We want to abduct Him and make Jesus our kind of Savior. To do what we think He should do. But the point is, John 3, 19 will say, Light has come, and the darkness loved darkness more than light. The world is a world of darkness. Thus, because the world of darkness did not understand the light in Christ, the world of darkness opposes the light of Christ. Later in John 1, he will say, verses 10 and following, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. But the world did not know him. And he came unto his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is tragedy of tragedies. The creator God invaded creation and creation did not understand him. Did not recognize him. Did not believe in him. But that creation opposed him. Worse than that, the people that God had revealed himself to in the Old Testament. The Jewish people. He had given them their law. He had explained Himself through His Word to them. When He came to them, they colluded to crucify the Son of God on the cross. The darkness is disinclined to the light because the light drives out the darkness. The darkness is not only disinclined to the light, but the darkness hates the light and seeks to destroy it. This is why Jesus was killed on the cross. He was seen as a threat to the darkness. This motif of cosmic clashing between light and darkness is seen throughout human experience. But we must understand that the text of Scripture in verse 5 does not just end with a misunderstanding and opposition, but it clearly says to us, That the darkness cannot win. The light of Christ wins. Jesus wins. Thanks be to God. That Jesus Christ when he died. Did not lose in dying. But he won the ultimate victory. Rising from the dead. I think Satan is panicking. So many of us act and talk like we think Satan is sovereign. And we need to stop that. Satan cannot win. Satan has already lost. Christ wins the victory. You are the people of God. You have the hope that is capital H hope. The light overcomes the darkness. And whenever light comes... The darkness flees. This is the hope of history. Now the application. And I have three points. That I hope will step us up to the ultimate joy. 
of what I want to say to you this morning. First, I want to talk to you about transcendent questions and human life. Transcendent questions and human life. Our text reminds us today that you cannot grasp adequately today-to-day issues and questions of life until you get the ultimate transcendent questions answered. You are wondering, how can we get along better? How can nations stop warring with each other? How can races stop fighting with each other? How can societies turn into places of goodness rather than places of hatred? You cannot understand those issues until you understand the greatest issue of all, and that is, how do we relate to God Himself? That is why the church is the place where the answer exists to every issue before us. John doesn't just jump into specific questions. John begins with the greatest question of all. What is out there? What is beyond time and space? What happens at the end of life? Is there anything that exists outside of material reality? And thus he begins with God Himself. I call you church. We must together speak of God all the time. He is the answer to every question. He is the issue in every problem that we face. And we must have that statement made to the world whenever and wherever we have opportunity to speak to Him. If you come to me and say, help me with my problems, but don't talk to me about God, I'll laugh and walk away. i got nothing to tell you. Because you've refused the very thing that will help you. You must understand God, first of all. Number two, second application. Sin's awful effect on the human mind and soul. Sin's awful effect on the human mind and soul. And so, this is a very deep cavern, and it's a dark one. Sin not only exists in the human race, but it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. It has saturated everything. We, we speak of total depravity as a theological term that describes the impact of sin on the human experience. Every single thing in in a person's life has been impacted by sin. Thus, everything in our society is impacted by sin. And the more you give in to sin, the more you allow sin to take its grasp and hold on your life, you don't remain the same. You get worse and worse and worse. Sin is voracious in its appetite. If you give your mind to it, it will consume your mind. If you give your heart to it, it will consume your emotions. Sin always consumes everything that is given to it until finally darkness covers the mind and the soul to the degree that we speak of a reprobate mind. I refer to Romans chapter 1. Where sin is not only tolerated, but sin is embraced. Sin is enjoyed. Sin actually becomes the context of life in which we live until sin becomes so overwhelmingly a powerful in our lives that it changes how we think and feel. A person can actually get to the point where he thinks he's actually right when in fact he's actually wrong. That is insanity. And when he gets to the 
place where he thinks he's right when in fact he's wrong, then he will look at those who are right and say you are wrong when in fact they're right. Does that make sense? That explains the opposition to the gospel, to the church, to Jesus, and to Christians in our day. A person can actually degenerate into this darkness where sin's effect is such that we actually believe we are morally superior in things we believe which are actually wrong, that we will excuse anything and everything, including violence against other people. I, I often think, and I'll just briefly re refer to it, we, just, we don't have time to go into it today, of Paul's words in Ephesians 4. And he says the following, don't walk like Gentiles walk, that is, don't walk like unsaved people walk, in what he calls the futility of their minds. And then he says, of their futile minds being darkened, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. One writes of this text, there is a hardness, a stubborn rebellion, which makes it impossible for the darkness to understand or open up to the light. And this is going on in our college campuses right now. Professors with PhDs are teaching darkness. And young people are gobbling it up. And we're told we cannot have God on our campuses. And we cannot have the Bible on our campuses. Where that is the only light there is. And what happens to the light? It is shut out. It is refused. It is opposed. It is marginalized, and then it is attacked by those in darkness. This is the awful effect of sin on the mind and soul of a person, of a family, and of a society. Brings me to my third application. I want to leave you with hope. Because... The idea today is not, is not ultimately negative. It's positive. Because here is my third application. Christ is the hope of humanity. What is the hope? Let's write a bunch of books. Let's do podcasts. Let's come up with some new ideologies and, and come up with a way of fixing things. The church better not talk like that. The church must stand throughout time and say one thing. We have one string on our guitar. Christ is the hope of humanity. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. He is the hope of your life, of your family. He is the hope of your community. He is the hope of your society. He is the hope of your culture. John chapter 3, we will see that He is the hope of new birth. Your life can change. You can be born again. John 4, we'll see. He is the hope for living water, life, heart satisfaction that takes away the bitterness and anger and violence of life and gives you joy and love and goodness. In John chapter 6, we will find that Jesus is so central to our existence that we must feed on Him. He is our life. John 10, we will see that Jesus will give us eternal life and we will never perish. John 11, we will see that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ alone. Life comes down to this. If I could put the cookies on the bottom shelf. It's Christ or perish. That's true of you. That's true of this nation. 
what will it be? What must I do? The Bible says, repent and believe. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin and believe on Christ as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps I'm talking to somebody right here and now. Oh, you go to church. I'm not asking you about church. I'm asking you about Jesus. Do you repent of your sin and believe on Christ? Will you follow Him as your personal Lord and Savior? Your eternal destiny is at stake. Your eternal joy is at stake. May the Spirit speak to our hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is profound. It is extraordinary. But it's also simple. To turn to Christ. To turn away from sin. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I pray that you would Apply this message in the hearts and lives of people as you see fit to accomplish your purposes in your kingdom and in this world. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you did not let us soak in our destruction. But you sent your only begotten Son the Lord Jesus Christ, to be life and light in this dark world. Oh, I pray that we will come to Him as life and light even now. In Jesus' name we pray.